morning, church. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you all had a good time with families. Pray that you were able to celebrate and have rest. Just want to invite you to join us in worship. Just invite God into your homes. Invite him into your space. Let's focus our hearts and turn our hearts to Jesus.
God, we thank you that there is nothing that you can't do, that you break down the walls. You bring freedom in life, Jesus. God, we are so thankful for you. Bless you, Jesus.
there's no one higher, no one greater. We stand in awe of you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. God, we worship you. We thank you for your greatness, God. Good morning, church. Welcome to Epicenter West LA's Sunday service. My name is Philip, and I'll be your MC this morning. For those of you who may be tuning in for the first time, thanks for joining us. If it is your first time with us, or if you would like to get connected, please scan the QR code on your screen with the camera on your phone. To share a little bit about us, Epicenter West LA is located in the neighborhood of Palms on the West Side. We are all about loving LA, living in LA, and leaving a legacy by the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the best ways to engage with our community and get plugged in is through life groups. We have groups meeting throughout the week. And for more information and to sign up for a life group, please visit our Epicenter West LA app or our website. Another important part of our community is giving. We believe that giving honors God and allows us to partner with the church while practically supporting its operating costs. You can also find the links to give on our church app or website. Just a reminder, our monthly in-person service is just around the corner. It will be on Sunday, December 13th at 10.30 a.m. in the courtyard of Adot Shalom. This event is first come, first served, and by registration only, with a limited number of spots available. So head over to our website or app to get on that list. Don't miss out on an amazing opportunity to catch up with our church body and to worship together. We would love to see you there. That's it for me. Thanks so much for listening. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pastor Chris for the message. Well, good morning, church, and happy Thanksgiving to you all. Um, praying that our church community is really enjoying this holiday and choosing into gratefulness. Uh, today, I have... Uh, announcement to make, we are at the very end of our Ten Commandment series. What a journey we have been on in the Ten Commandments. It comes to an end today. Uh, today, we are going to finish by looking at the tenth pillar of freedom, the tenth pillar of reconstructing our life to live in total freedom, the tenth pillar to guard and enhance and protect the shalom life that God offers us into. And again, as I've been doing this entire series, I give props to Pastor Daryl Johnson. This is his sermon, it's his series, with a little bit of me sprinkled in. So I thought, since we are at the end, I thought it would only be appropriate that one last time we read and meditate on the entire Ten Commandments. And so if you are able, would you please stand to honor the reading of God's Word. We are in Exodus chapter 20, and we are going to start in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land your Lord God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. We thank you, Jesus, that you have brought us together. We thank you that you are in our midst, and we thank you for the grace of your word, that you have given us your word, that it's more than just uh, words on a page or a screen, that it's your living word given to us that we would know you, that we would know how to have the shalom life that only you offer. Lord Jesus, come and make your word come alive in our hearts this morning. Remove any distraction or any apathy, anything that would keep us from being locked in to what you want to say to us. We are listening. We pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, in many ways, today marks the end to basically sort of the, uh, the, the altered or COVID vision of 2020. We had a whole vision uh, coming into this year. And of course, uh, COVID changed a lot of things, including the vision that we were going to have for a church. But if you remember, we started a long time ago in God's whole story, really wanting to redo the foundation uh, and get a deep foundation in our mindset, a theology, a, a worldview that is going to shape us as a church community as we go forward. I'm very excited about the real practical things that we are going to be uh, embracing as a church family uh, over the next months into the new year. But I'm really grateful for this time that we've had to lay a foundation to understand God's whole heart in how he wants to build our lives individually, as families, and as a society. And now here we are in the final sermon, the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment of the 10 commandments reads, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Covet. To covet something is to want something to yearn for it, to desire it. You you shall not covet your neighbor's house, their clothes, their job, their family situation, their travel experience, their social status, their bank account. You shall not covet. Michael Josephin shares a supposedly true story back in the day that takes us to the heart of the command. Two men went on a gold mining expedition. They discovered 200 nuggets of gold. On the way back, one of the men took a nasty fall, injured himself so severely that he ended up dying. Just before he died, he said this to his partner, give my wife whatever you want. He was talking about the 200 nuggets of gold, give my wife whatever you want. Well, after the funeral, the partner gave the man's wife just one nugget of gold. She was outraged. She was also a little confused that her husband, according to this man, had told the man, his partner, to give her what he wanted instead of making sure you give my wife 50%. Anyway, she took the man to court, and the case went before a judge, and this judge had a reputation for going by the letter of the law, super strict judge. And the partner was happy about this reputation because he hoped the judge would take the words, give her what you want, literally. After hearing all the facts involved, the judge ruled that the partner had to give the man's wife 199 nuggets of gold. The partner was outraged. Why, he exclaimed, my partner told me to give his wife what I want. And the judge replied, that's exactly what I have ruled. You wanted 199 gold nuggets, and so that's exactly what she will get. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. If you've been with us through the entire Ten Commandments, you will notice a different feel on your soul when you hear this one. Up to this point, in the first nine, you may have been able to feel, yeah, you know, I'm not living the commandments perfectly, but I'm not doing so bad either. But then we get to this last one, the tenth, and it breaks our delusions that we are doing just fine in obeying the good law. 
you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. At one point, Jesus encountered a rich man. This man came up to Jesus and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the big red flag question, right? One of the most significant questions you could ever ask Jesus. Well, Jesus lists out the commands. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And the man said proudly, teacher, I have obeyed all of these since my youth. But notice something. When Jesus listed the commands, first he didn't list the first uh, chunk of commands that have to do with God. He, he, he starts at verse, I mean, the command, the sixth command. But then he stops short of going to the tenth. He only lists commands five through nine. Why not list the tenth command, the command that goes to the heart of the other commands? Because as long as Jesus stops short of the 10th command, the man, the rich man, can think that he has kept all of the commands, that he has done well. So after he proudly tells Jesus this, we're told that Jesus looks at him with love and says, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. The man's face fell, he became grieved, and he walked away. So what's going on? Jesus lists all of the commands, stops short of the 10th, and then Jesus calls him to sell all that he has. Is that not Jesus' way of bringing the man to the 10th commandment, of showing him, no, you're not there yet? Isn't that Jesus' way of helping the man see he hasn't actually kept all of the commandments? He certainly has not kept the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. There's no way that he could have kept that command because now God is standing before him in the person of Jesus, calling him to follow, and he can't do it. Eternal life is only found in a relationship to God through Jesus. It is only found in a real relationship with the lawgiver. Eternal life itself was calling out for this man to follow him, but the man can't do what he needs to do to follow his possessions have become his God and his security. They have become the basis of his identity. How would we respond to the same invitation? The man left grieved because he couldn't follow Jesus into unknown territory. You see, when we break the 10th command, you shall not covet, we've already broken the first command. Or we could say, if we break the first commandment, we will always and automatically break the tenth. I believe it's why Jesus omitted the first four commands that had to deal with the relationship with God. He listed the commands that deal with our interactions with the neighbors and left out the tenth to show the man, when you can't live out the tenth, you're not living out the first. When you're not living out the first, you always and automatically will break the tenth. In the first commandment, the loving God is telling us something about ourselves which we could never have discovered on our own. Namely, that we were not only made by God, we were made for God. We were created in such a way that only God can satisfy the longing of our hearts. And when we break the first command, when we have let something come between us and God, our hearts start craving anything that promises satisfaction. Break the first commandment, and you will always and automatically break the tenth. We become souls running on empty, doing anything and everything that would fill the hole in our souls. So are we not at all surprised then as we see our larger society in America move away from church, move away from Jesus, that we are becoming more and more materialistic as a society? In fact, you can actually trace the movement of Christianity around the world as it com comes into cultures that are very poor and broken. And as, uh, as the cultures begin to embrace uh, the, the gospel of Jesus over generations, the culture begins to be more and more blessed materially by God. But then eventually, sadly, you see large portions of the society begin to turn away from the giver of the gifts and begin to put their hope and their satisfaction into the material comforts. Isn't that the story, the spiritual story of our country? We become more and more addicted to and, and, and needing of pleasure, of comfort, and of entertainment. 
Once we no longer find our satisfaction in God, we try to find it anywhere. We need to find it in anything that promises it, right? A headline of an old LA Times editorial rightly summed up the new American focus, life, liberty, and the pursuit of cheap stuff. The fact is, when we break the first command, it just sets off a domino effect and we start breaking all of them. When God is no longer the center of our lives, we just start to unravel. We break commandment number two and form a God in our own image that fits our understanding of the world and what we want God to be to us. Then we break number three, using God's name in vain, trying to get God to do what we want. Then we break number four and never stop the rat race, looking for satisfaction apart for God, and so never stopping to eagerly get the unique part of God that we can only get on the Sabbath. Then we break the fifth, we don't honor mom and dad because to do so gets in the way of our quest for personal satisfaction. Then we break the sixth, and maybe we don't literally murder, but we let our anger spill out freely, justifying ourselves for harboring bitterness and insults. Then we break the seventh, maybe not literally, but letting lust get a hold into our wandering hearts searching for satisfaction. Then we break the eighth because we can't trust God to take care of us. Then we break the ninth by twisting and manipulating the truth for our own advantage. So by the time we come to the tenth, we're so far gone, we just need to start over and go back to number one. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, that coveting is idolatry. Idolatry is worshiping something else as God instead of the true God. So he's saying that when I want something that I don't have, when I want something my neighbor has, I'm worshiping a false God, breaking the first commandment. Why? Because when we covet anything we do not have, our hearts are saying, God has not been good to us. God is not good enough for us, that we need more than what God in his perfect goodness has given us, that we need more than God. Jeff Bjorth says, when we no longer have the loving true God as our God, it doesn't mean we have no God, it means that we have made ourselves God. So, that, so we believe that life is ultimately about serving myself, not serving God. So everything is seen from the perspective, how is this good for me? Because I'm now the center of my life. Coveting occurs when we put ourselves at the center of our world. Coveting is first and foremost a sin against God. It is more of a sin against God than it is against our neighbor who we are coveting. When I covet, I've made myself the center of my world and all that matters are my needs and my fulfillments. There are two famous stories in the Old Testament of coveting. One is with King Ahab, who even though he is a rich king, wants the vineyard of a guy named Naboth. He asks the guy for it, and the guy says, this vineyard has been in my family for generations. It's all that I have. Well, Ahab is so upset, his wife arranges for the guy to be killed so that Ahab can get what he coveted for. The second famous example is King David, who wants the wife of one of his soldiers. He gets so twisted about wanting her that he has the commanding officer send the soldier to the front of the battle so that he's killed in battle so that he can get his wife. Both of them are horrible stories of what coveting can do. But here's the thing. When you understand King Ahab, you expect him to do this. King Ahab and his wife were evil to the core. But you don't expect King David to fall like this. He is a man after God's own heart. David was more righteous, more focused on God, more dedicated to God than any of us could ever be. He was so righteous that God promised that Jesus would come from the line of David's family so that David can say that he is blood with Jesus. My point is this. This last command is not for the evil people of this world. It is not for those who are lost and absolutely gone in their evil. It is for the pious people of the world, the people who wish to be praised and affirmed as upright people simply because they do a pretty good job of, of obeying the other commandments. Paul himself also explains in Romans chapter 7 that this 10 commandment, this one, brought him to his knees. We are all guilty of coveting. It's a part of all of our stories, of our struggles and our journeys with sin. It is who we are. This, this is the human struggle right here. And so as I'm pushing it 
as I'm really trying to challenge today, do not hear this with a wave of guilt. This is us uncovering who we really are as fragile, broken human beings. See, we just can't escape the struggle. We can't escape the pull towards coveting and desiring what we don't have. Our entire American society is built around it. Ronald Wilfer says it well when he says, our society can only be kept going by a, by a constant and fresh supply of men and women driven by greed, unfulfilled desire, and self-centered ambition. In order to create a demand for all the stuff that everybody wants to sell us, they have to keep stimulating our desire to possess what they offer. And when they keep stimulating these desires, they convince us that our basic human needs are much more complicated than they actually are. Radio Shack, may they rest in peace, once had the motto, for all the stuff you didn't know you needed. <laughs> Look at all the ads in a magazine and you will be shocked at all the stuff uh, that you never knew was absolutely essential, crucial for you to have to be happy in life. The gambling craze is driven by the breaking of this command. To covet is to gamble. To covet is to have an out of control credit card problem. Credit cards simply take the waiting out of wanting. When you look at the history of our country, you sadly realize that over time we have totally changed. As what we used to call a vice, now we call a virtue. Greed and desire for more. Advertising that creates and fuels this new virtue spends over $250 billion a year in America alone to help us break the good commands of a good God. $250 billion a year to keep us from freedom, to keep us in chains. Listen to James chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Words spoken two, over 2,000 years ago that feel like they were crafted for us today. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Rich Mullen says, everyone I know says that they just need one thing. What they really mean is that they just need one thing more, and then one thing more, and then one thing more. The quest for more and more that drives our souls is the quest of our souls running on empty. The quest of our souls who have made themselves the center of the chase and will never be satisfied. As Myra Boone says, it is no easy task to walk this earth and find peace. We are so charged with desire, it is hard to be at rest. Desire is stronger than satisfaction. Desire stirs the drink. And spirituality is about what we do with that desire. Everyone is a spiritual creature. That's what the commandment number one shows us. It's what we could not learn on our own. Everyone has a spirituality. And it is found, your practical spirituality is not found in what you believe. It is not found in what you read. It is not found in, in services you attend. Your practical spirituality is found in what you are doing with your desires. If God is not our all-consuming passion, then we create a God-sized hole in our soul, and then we become addicted to the things we try to put in the hole. I remember when COVID first broke. It seems like a long time. I guess it was a while ago, right? And we were in full-on stay-at-home quarantine. I found myself over these weeks uh, getting more and more down, and I just assumed it was because it, I was just down, you know, because of everything. But as I prayed on it, right, going to Jesus to help get me out of the funk that was growing, I realized as I prayed on it uh, that I was uh, watching too many of these YouTube videos of celebrities showing off how they were quarantining in their huge mansions with all of their niceties and luxury, and that was causing coveting in me, in my heart, and that that was actually the root of me kind of getting into a little bit of a funk. I had once again slipped into the spiritual cancer of coveting. And so what are we to do? It feels like this can be so overwhelming. Well, first, look at what God does when he sees us reject him and desire other things. 
as we've said through this whole series, these 10 commandments were given to Moses on top of a mountain. God gave them to Moses and he brought them down to the people. The people could not obey these commands. They did not obey these commands. We do not obey these commands. We break the first commandment and then we start desiring things we don't have. God sees our rejection of him. He sees that we have put ourselves as God, that we would rather have stuff than him. And instead of punishing us for this, he comes down the mountain and lives with us to help us overcome our sin, to help us obey the command, to set us free. That's incredible forgiveness. That's incredible love. Listen to this amazing summary from Ephesians 3 in light of what we're talking about right now and yearn for this love and freedom. Ephesians 3, 16 to 19, that according to the riches of his glory that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. He, God can't get closer than that, y'all. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breath and length and height and depth and to know, know intimately the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God comes down the mountain to get past your mind, past just a mere belief in him, to get into your soul, your inmost being, so that his love and his spirit will fill you up with the fullness of God to satisfy you completely to no longer covet. So let's get practical. How do we obey this 10th command so that we can obey the first? First, redirect our cravings. All of our cravings are symptoms for our craving for God, right? When you are in the middle of sexual lust, when you are craving to blow up in anger, when you are craving for more material stuff or comforts, when you are craving for a new life, you're craving for more of God. The other things are symptoms of the deeper craving, and so we just need to learn to redirect our cravings to God in practical ways. Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. One day, church, we are actually going to truly believe this day after day after day, and it's going to rock our world and how we live. One day, we're going to truly believe that all of our hunger and our thirst and desire is for God, and it's actually going to show in how we live. So we just got to help each other keep redirecting our cravings to God. Jesus says in Matthew 6, don't be anxious about the basic needs of your life. Seek first the kingdom of God, and then all those basic needs will be provided for. Be anxious about seeking more of God. Be anxious about desiring him more. Turn the desires about other things into a desire for God. When everyone around is going hard after more food and more stuff and more experiences and more status and more travel and more security, you go hard after God. And then watch how much more satisfied you will be. You will never stop chasing that desire until you grab onto God. Do not be the people that end your life and realize that you never stopped chasing the desire. All of the cravings are symptoms of a craving for God. And church, I got to tell you, I'm just a little tease that the elders, we had our retreat last weekend. I am so excited for how we're going to enter 2021 because we are together as a community are going to get so practical and so unique and personal to each person to help us into this life of being satisfied in God. It is going to be really exciting. Second, we obey this command by giving away as much as we personally can. We step back and realize that everyone is drowning around us in always needing more stuff. And we need to push back against this by going in the opposite direction. In terms of the material aspects of this command. So instead of being consumed by getting, we need to be consumed with giving, right? A fact of life. We need nothing that is in the malls. We need none of it, but we desperately need Jesus. Manage your physical stuff and your money as if you truly believe this and finally be free. Uh, my family right now, 
uh, is in the midst of, because I've been in this, uh, this series and I've been in this command, you know, last couple weeks preparing for this. And I'm just so fired up about it. I'm so convicted. I'm like, at one point, I'm really disgusted with myself because I'm looking around my house and I'm like, what the heck? Where does all this garbage come from? It's like, and, and we, we have purged before, but I don't know what it is. It's like physical stuff is organic. It just grows in our dang house. And, I, and, and, and I'm just like talking to my wife and I'm talking to my kids. And so we are literally in the midst of this Thanksgiving break, purging garbage from our stuff. But not just garbage. We are praying about also giving away at least one thing that is really valuable to us. We, I am just so excited. We're just trying to purge. And I tell you, you feel it when you start to actually really get past just the the little bit of garbage, but like really trying to downsize, you you have these emotional attachments to stuff that tells you just what a sickness and that we're in all the time as Americans. You know, one of the problems with giving and the call to give our money and stuff away is that it's often only rooted in other people's needs. Now, obviously, and we've talked about this a lot, right, church? We should give uh, right? Because we should be helping people who don't have as much, right? We should give because people are in need. Remember Jesus called to the rich man, uh, give everything to the poor, right? And this is also true, but what we have to remember is that fundamentally we are also to keep giving and giving and giving because we're in need. We adopt a lifestyle of giving and simplicity so that we can obey the 10th commandment, so that we can stop the illusion that all of this stuff is going to fill the hole in our soul. Giving things away is for our own soul's health. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Sacrificial, ongoing generosity saves the soul. Give all that you can. I mean, I challenge you today, or the day that you are listening to this, give something away. I challenge you to give something precious to you. I am, I am, and, and ask me, I am currently praying about it right now. Uh, I challenge you to give extra money away this week, whatever. Need less in order to be more. Need less in order to be more. Do not make the mistake of believing that our spirituality with Jesus is meant for our feelings and for our thinking and our speaking. Get practical, get functional, get radical, and so that you can be liberated and healed. Third, we obey this command by choosing uh, gratefulness and choosing to seek God's heart for his eyes to interpret our life. This is so huge that we help each other in a, in a larger culture that, was, that just is elevating more and more complaining and venting and, and all these things, right? We want to help choose into gratefulness. And this is so huge in terms of the status of your relational life your romantic life, whatever that status is, right now in this present moment, God wants you to see that this is the very best that he has for you now, and there can be nothing better right now today in the status of your marriage life, single life, dating life, whatever it is. And when it comes to your career, your income, sort of your uh, bucket lists, whatever that is, we got to choose into gratefulness and helping each other with eyes to see that if we are truly in Jesus, there is nothing that we actually need. And this gets us into the fourth way we obey this command by worshiping God with our whole being. Because worship is to feast on God. When we come into worship, we're bringing an empty soul to God and are believing and expecting to be filled up by God. God did not create you to just be a good little Christian girl or good little Christian boy. He created you to enjoy God, to be happy in God. And so we honor God by not, uh, you know, we, we don't, we, we honor God not by like giving him a salute, even if it's a hearty salute, soldier Chris is reporting for duty, right? We, that's not how we honor God. We don't honor God by giving him a tip, even if it's generous to say, oh, I notice you and I'm grateful, peace out. We honor God when God becomes the greatest joy of our lives, when we can't stop thinking of him, 
when we love to be around people who love him, when we love to learn about him, when we want to change our lives to please him, when we just enjoy him and are in love with him, when he becomes the greatest joy of our lives, that's when we honor him. And that is when we are finally satisfied. Passionate worship feeds the soul. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. When you can truly say this, you're finally free. The most powerful antidote to a restless, coveting heart is genuine, passionate worship of God every day. We should be jumping out of bed on Sundays, making sure that we are logged in early so that we can soak in all the worship that our team puts together of God and get our soul food and soul healing. Extra sleep, extra food, extra hobbies to try and squeeze in on Sunday mornings that keep you from worship is just keeping you from freedom and keeping you from craving uh, and breaking the 10th commandment throughout the week. We got to see that God gives something unique and special on his Sabbath day with the church family, something that we cannot get on the other days. So we got to lock in and, and get here and drink it in and worship him with passion. But then we learn how to worship God every day, to find that place in our homes, in our cars, anywhere that we can freely worship God and be satisfied in him with song and music or just with our, our, our words or just with our art, whatever it is. Worship of God will quench the three save cravings of our soul. You know, um, many of you know that uh, uh, I live with Crohn's disease, and before they knew what it was, it was some rough years. And I would have these months of just not being able to digest food. Uh, my, my body would be re rejecting everything. And so it, for months, I would literally every day have to choose. Either I eat, and then I'm in, all in pain all day long and in the bathroom, or I don't eat, and I just drink uh, just water and some juice and some, like, broth. Uh, and, and so I'm weak, but I'm not in the bathroom in, 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 in pain. And it was just, which, which is the, 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 the suffering I want to choose today? So I was constantly tired. I was constantly craving food and energy. And so obviously on Sundays, I wouldn't eat because I needed to be able to minister at the service and, and not have to run to the bathroom. And so uh, every time after service, especially in terms of having to give all the adrenaline, I would get home and I would just be so physically hungry and tired. But as the, the, the month into two months started to wear on, I started to realize something. Sundays were the happiest days of the week because I would be in the worship of God with my spiritual family. And I realized that while I was physically tired, my cravings for food went away that day. And then, it, and then I realized it started, that's right. And, and when I worship during every day, there's like an hour or two after that worship when I didn't think about my, weak, my weakness and my physical weakness. It was the most peaceful and joyful time of the day. And I realized in that time of extreme suffering that we're not supposed to be in all the time, that I learned something about how I and us are uniquely wired. That when literally you cannot get food and energy and have no energy for any hobbies or nothing, God can sustain you. It's how we were made. We cannot be too busy to forget to worship God every day. You, do, you know how they say, don't go to your grocery uh, shopping hungry, right? Don't, don't, don't do that hungry because you end up buying way too much. Don't go to the food store hungry, all right? Uh, you'll, especially Costco, that'll destroy you. Um, the cravings of hunger will mess you up in a food store. In the same way, you should not go into any do, new day without worshiping God. If you don't start your day filled up with your God-sized cravings with God and don't come back to him throughout the day, well, then you are going to spend your days craving after all kinds of things, being a slave and making bad decisions. I'm going to bring our worship team back up here right now. Church, worship God every day and watch the cravings for other things just go away. The best life is not found when you get someone else's life. I can't say it strong enough. The best life is not found when you get somebody else's life. The best life is found when you finally believe that in Jesus, you're living your best life. When you finally realize you have Jesus and that's all that you need. There is nothing more powerful, 
more attractive, more inspiring than a woman, a man who is totally content with their life, with their struggles, with their victories. When we're satisfied in God, we get closer to becoming that man and that woman. Church, let's worship him now. Let's bring our broken, fragile hearts right into the presence of a good and satisfying God. If we need to repent, repent. Our repentance is not set us up for punishment or guilt. It sets us, sets us up for being cleansed and purged of this, this horrendous sin. It's like, you know, it, it just sets us up for the love and the grace of Jesus to come in to help us begin to think rightly, to begin to live rightly, to react rightly. And as you worship God, ask him, ask him, ask him that courageous question. Lead me, Jesus. What, what do I need to do to get more of you and have the courage to do it? Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, in this time, especially in this time, would you come and satisfy us deeply that we would be people in the midst of, of everything that we are going through, in the midst of whatever we're going through in our lives, that we would find you, worship you, be satisfied in you, that we would be people of great simplicity in this material world, great generosity, that we could declare with our mouths, with our feelings, and with our actions that you and you alone are, are satisfied food, that you are our drink, that you are our life, that in you we found the treasure. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Satisfy us. This is your time.
Devotion. 
church. Pray you guys are blessed as you go out. Pray you've had a wonderful Thanksgiving week, vacation with families, loved ones, whatever that looks like. Just pray that you're blessed. Amen, church.